According to the Apostle Paul, yes, Christians can be deceived. So your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And he gives us a, a hint at, at, at part of the nature of that deception is that the simplicity is the sincerity. The gospel is quite simple to the point directly. There's no hidden, hidden, hidden underneath teaching. It's all right there for anyone to see. But one of the Satan's strategies that you can see just by what he said so far is to complicate it. Okay, like, yeah, you're saved, but you get, you can, you got to do works to stay saved. and Or, you know, your good deeds have to outweigh your bad. I mean, I could go on and on. There's so many ways that people are just taken away from the beautiful simplicity of coming to Jesus Christ and asking him to forgive them of their sins. It's just... This is what Satan wants to do. This is our spiritual warfare. M much of it has to do with deception. So he goes on to say, For if there, he that comes preaches another Jesus. What? Another Jesus? Yeah, there's a lot of Jesuses. There are many Jesuses. Like, for example, the Jesus of the Mormon church is Satan's half-brother. They each had a plan for man. God chose Jesus over Satan. That's how he... That's not the Jesus that can save you. If you confess with your mouth and accept Jesus, the half-brother of Satan, you're not going to heaven. You can't go there. The Jesus, I used to see a Jesus. He was just the cutest thing in a big, huge robe, and he had a crown. He's in the arm of the real power, Mary. There's no salvation in that Jesus. That's a billion people in the world, by the way, Roman Catholic. <laughs> you can't be saved by that Jesus. Now look, I hate to complicate it, and I'm not going to complicate it. I'm going to simplify it. There's only one way to salvation. That is the Jesus of the Bible. The only, like John said, uh, he quoted Jesus in his prayer. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I remember when I was in high school, and uh, there was a, musical came out that was so powerful that he, the radio was playing the songs and so were the churches. Jesus Christ Superstar. And everyone was so happy. Finally, they made a movie about Jesus. Yeah, but it's the gospel according to Judas. There's no resurrection. Okay. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Another one came out around the same time. Really nice musical. Godspell. Jesus is a clown in Central Park in New York with a gang of clowns. Okay, and people were, get, people were getting into Jesus. Oh, wow, it's great. My kid was into drugs, now he's into Jesus. Which Jesus? There's only one that died on the cross. There's that, the, the real Jesus hates sin and evil. That's why he died, to remove it, to eradicate it. He is against all that is false, all that is evil. There's the... And every single person, all of us, without shame, without exception, all of us share in the shame of the original sin. I have a share, you have a share, we have a share. Now, if someone says, that don't sound fair to me, let me just tell you two things. Adam was the best person for the job. You would have failed too, and I would have failed too. God selected the best person to test, and when he fell, we all fell, and we all share in that shame. And the second thing I have to say is, if you reject that, you reject that. The communion table. Why? Because of the logic that says one man could die and plunge us all into condemnation. And I'm almost virtually quoting Romans 5. That same logic says one man could do one act of obedience and bring every single person in the world back into right standing with God. Look, the Spirit told me they're practicing their religion. That's their zeal. In some cases, some of them are just thieves, liars, brigands. But a lot of them are actually following their religion. It's the new religion. The new sacrament is abortion. See, someone says, well, how can they be religious if they're violent? Don't you know that every single false religion is violent to the core? That is one of the great lessons of the primal story of Cain and Abel. It's not about anger or murder or losing your temper. It's about religion. Let me just put it this way. If you won't let 
Jesus Christ die for your sins in your place before a holy God, it turns out you'll make someone pay for your sins. Someone's going to have to pay. That's like Muslims. You know, I was on a plane with a Muslim, and we got into a discussion. And I hope the other people were worried because he was saying stuff. Like, I told him the gospel, and he slammed his fist on the thing and said, "We Muslims need no sacrifice." And I said, "Then why do you shed blood everywhere in the world?" The New Testament mentions Cain in a very strange way. It's a talk about love in 1 John. This is the last person you'd think would pop up in a talk about love. He says, well, let's love one another, lay down our lives for each other. Not like Cain, who slew his brother. And why did he slay him? Because his brother's works were righteous. But the word he uses is slew, which in the Greek has a religious connotation. He didn't just kill his brother. He didn't just murder his brother. He didn't just off his brother. He offered his brother, not to the holy God, but to his own wounded pride. He made an offering. It's all religious to the core. Our religion is individualized. The new religion is groups. Everyone's in a group. Some are very good, virtuous groups just by being in the group. Others are just plain, flat, evil, and there is no way to get out of the group. Now, someone one time tried to get me to apologize for the sins of all the people from European extraction down through time. And I very politely told this guy, he was a pastor actually, uh, he used to live here. His name was Francis. And he'd go around the world apologizing for the sins of Europeans. And I said, Francis, I said, uh, sorry, I can't go there. I have a religion already. I have a basis for forgiveness in my religion. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to make us unrighteous uh, and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. I said, you're not going to get me to deny that by getting me to confess some group sin somewhere, which is impossible anyway. I don't know what my ancestors did. I don't know what anyone's ancestors did. You take someone out of the streets out there, their ancestor might have been a Zulu eating babies or something. Who knows? <laughs> Everyone has to stand before God on their own. What you're seeing is the outworking of a brand new civic religion that's been imposed by Satan on America. And believe me, there are more than enough Christians buying into it. Why? Like Paul said, look, I'm worried about you. You're going to be corrupted from the simplicity that's in Christ into something that's not even remote. Okay, we have our apostles and prophets, and they have their uh, prophets and apostles and Marx and Freud and uh, all kinds of people. Malcolm X, <laughs> Martin Luther King. <laughs> Who, by the way, wouldn't even recognize what's going on here today because he called for don't judge by the color of the skin, but the content of the character. So he had the right religion, evidently. This is a religious movement that is antichrist to the core. Absolute. But it's got its own righteousness. We have our righteousness. I sing this song. He is all my righteousness. I stand complete in him and I worship him. We have our righteousness. It is a gift of God from Jesus Christ bequeathed on anyone who believes. They have their righteousness. Who are the righteous? The ones that go along with the leftism. The ones that pipe the party line. The ones that if they're in the wrong group, they will shuffle and bow and apologize for the sins of everyone for the last 10 generations. <laughs> this is participation in an antichrist movement. This is a very, very powerful, sophisticated religious movement, even though most people involved don't even uh, probably look at it that way. It's carrying people along. And yes, it's violent. All false religion is violence. Mormonism used to kill people. They had a doctrine, blood atonement. You can kill someone to get them to heaven. Islam, I mean, do I need to even say anything about that? The, the, the religion of 
perpetual hatred and war, okay? Uh, Buddhism, you think Buddhism, everyone says, oh, that's so Zen and all this other stuff. Oh, yeah, well, you ought to see Buddhism when it goes off. Okay, go to Burma. You'll find out that every single false religion is inherently violent. There's only one religion that brings peace to man, and that is the religion, when truly practiced, of the Lord Jesus Christ and his Father, God. Praise you, God. Now, anyway, I got way off my notes, all right? But look, uh, you got to apply the word to the times, right? Paul says, look, I'm worried. You might be deceived. There's another spirit. There's another gospel. There's another word. There's another sacrament. We just had our sacrament. And we only have two. That's the simplicity of Christ. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Ordained by Jesus Christ. Well, the fake religions, they have their sacraments. And the religion of leftism, which is the largest cult in America, the sacrament is abortion. Let me talk for a minute about that, even though I wasn't, didn't plan on it. The, 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 the sacrament of abortion, the most divisive subject in American history, and the reason why is because Look, you, you, everyone has a criticism of America, but I gotta say, I've never seen so many Christians in one place in all my life. I've traveled the world, okay? It's still got a very, very echo of a Christian presence, let's put it that way. So therefore, abortion is contentious. We just can't go along with it because it's murder. It's murder. Now here's the thing too, though it's 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 morphing, it's trans it's transforming. Yeah. I personally am against abortion. Okay, well, would you take a vaccine that's composed of aborted babies? In other words, let oh let's say you had a, a disfiguring disease that you couldn't walk and you couldn't see, and would you be cured if science came up with some cure from? aborted fetuses or stem cells. You talk about the devil's bargain. Yes. Yes. Always the question is asked, what will you sell out the truth for? What will you exchange the true religion for? A lot of people want to be uh, seen as woke or loving or compassionate and they'll throw everyone else under the bus. Not like those others, not like those others. We are the cool, hip, woke, loving people. So they will deny their brothers and sisters and the whole civilized world and go along with the crowd. You know what the Bible says? You shall not follow the multitude to do evil. Now let me get back to Satan and his devices, okay? He, look at uh, verse 13. Such are false apostles. Deceitful workers. Oh, who knew? There's true apostles. We got the 12 apostles. And there's false apostles. Deceitful workers. Transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. You would almost think there's an apostle of Christ. And don't marvel for Satan himself. Now, do, take this seriously. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Believe me. If Satan had his way, the war is never going to be good against evil. <laughs> That's just too simple and too instinctively easy to say, no, I don't want to go for evil. Always good against good. Humanistic good. Man-centered good. My wife prayed about the socialism. Socialism is a, quote, good cause. We care about the suffering and poverty and all this other stuff. Who, who cares if it's a failure everywhere it goes? It's the intentions that count. That's all that matters, intentions. If your intentions are right, well, there you go. You're great. Now, that is not the religion of Jesus Christ. And I'll show you why. Okay. Basically, my main subject I want to talk about today is deception and how Satan uses deception and to take deception seriously. But look, he says, don't marvel. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Oh, yeah, there's all kinds of do-gooders. Posturing, posing. We're the ones that care. Everyone else doesn't. 
We're the ones that love. Everyone else doesn't. We're the ones that are woke. Everyone else is asleep. We're the ones that just are so compassionate. Everyone else is so harsh. Easiest thing in the world to do. And in an emotional age, almost no one questions it. Look at 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10. <clears throat> I'm just going to look a few scriptures and then really get, get into this. Okay. Though, verse 3, though we walk in the flesh. Is it not true? We live in the flesh, right? We don't war after the flesh, though. My warfare is not in the flesh. I don't hate any person. I don't have any enemies, humanly speaking, that I would foster that enmity, that I would fight that enmity. Now, look, I don't love what a lot of people do, and I'm against their success if they're doing evil. I'd love to see them fail. But personally, no, we don't war after the flesh. Now look at four. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, let me walk this backwards, and let me show you that I believe this is one of the greatest insights in the Bible as to our warfare and what Satan is doing, actually. He says, every thought, and then you go back, the knowledge that exalts itself against knowledge of God. And then you go back, imaginations. And then you go back, uh, the reasonings, cast down imaginations, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought. All of the realm of satanic activity is right here. He is, I'm not saying he's a figment of our imagination, he's real. But the flaming darts that Matt was talking about, those are thoughts. Not every thought that crosses your mind is yours, and not every thought that goes out on the internet is someone else's. There is a mind behind what's going on. What's going on is very, very highly organized and is by someone who plays a long game, okay? Every thought, every reasoning, every imagination, every philosophy, this is our spiritual warfare within ourselves and within our culture. That's why I blog and all that stuff. I want to reach the minds of everybody, if at all possible. See, Paul, Paul did spiritual warfare. Now, I wrote a book. My first book was on spiritual warfare, and it was because these crazy uh, charismatics were just going out and doing all these weird things, like driving stakes in the ground to try to fight the devil, researching old occult books to find out what spirits were over areas. I mean, they were just doing this stuff that basically amounts to nothing but superstition and occultism, really, okay? And they're going into the occult because they thought that they wanted to fight Satan. And, you know, I looked at the Bible. What, what was Paul's spiritual warfare? It says when Paul went to a city, the first place he went is the synagogue. What did he do? Well, they said, well, we have a rabbi here. Would you come up and speak? speak? And he would reason, argue, open, and debate from Scripture that Jesus is the Messiah. That's what he did. Now, inevitably, he get kicked out of the synagogue. He'd go out in the streets. Now, if you want to see a great example of outside the synagogue, Acts 17, one of the great servants of the Bible. What's he doing, though? He's not binding Satan and giving him a black eye or marching around the city and proclaiming some weird thing, okay. He went to the philosophers and he challenged their philosophies. Why? Because it's vain imaginations, philosophies, reasonings, high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. That's what keeps people from ever accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And real spiritual warfare is real evangelism. It involves two things, the humility to find out what it is that a person actually believes. And then the second thing is the patience to walk through it with them if they will let you, to untangle and dismantle the intellectual and emotional barriers to salvation. That's the spiritual warfare. Now that's not as glamorous as marching around the city, driving a stake in, going to the top floor of the highest building and proclaiming to Satan. I mean, it was just insane. Okay. No, this is the real thing that you see in the Bible. Okay. 
I'll give you a great example of our own generation. What keeps more people from becoming a Christian than any other thought? What thought or imagination do more people hold that will never allow them to become a Christian? More than anything else. The idea that we're all good. We're all good. Or how about evolution? Evolution basically gave people permission. Not to fear God. The old world, I mean, it wasn't perfect. It was a bad place. We we're all sinners. But the old world of, of America, of early America, basically it was a God-fearing culture. And they prevented a lot of things. I mean, I, I doubt people had double locks on the doors and, and fences and gates and barriers around their property. The, look, people basically had a Christian consensus. But when evolution came in, once people entertain the vain imagination, which basically, look, look at this other phrase, high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Well, there's something God has shown all of us about the value of a human being, which that doctrine of Darwinism actually just directly attacks. And that is that man was made in the image of God, that we're not animals. Okay, so what's the spiritual warfare? That's where Satan is. That's why Satan's in the schools. Satan's in the culture. Satan's in the TV programming. Satan is in Hollywood, definitely. And it's loaded with vain imaginations, high things that dare exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, reasonings, philosophies that will prevent people from ever I mean, I got to tell you something. It's a miracle if you're saved that you're saved. It's a flat out miracle. It's a miracle I'm saved. Okay. Not only do the, the secular world have these lies, but the religious world. I used to belong to the Roman Catholic Church. Well, you say, well, Father, what's grace? Grace is an ethereal subject, substance. You never get enough of it to know you're saved. We dole it out to you according to our little hoops that you have to run through. <laughs> what a vain imagination. What is, what is repentance? Well, I never heard the word repentance. It was penance. Repentance is a great word. Penance is a horrible word. Those two sound so much alike, I didn't know until I was about 10 years saved that there was a difference. What is repentance? Repentance means you get to actually change your mind, change the direction you're going, and accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It's the best news of all, amen? What's penance? Well, you sin, right? And you feel really guilty. Now, that is one gift the Roman church has. They can load that guilt on in shovelfuls, okay? You feel guilty, don't you? Yes. Well, you go to the priest and admit your sin. Now, that won't forgive you. He will give you an assignment. Now, if I would have died believing that, oh, I'm good. I went to confession last, last week. As I'm going down to hell, I'd be telling myself that. Oh, I've got my scapular on. Anyone know what a scapular is? You could buy it in the basement of St. Ludmilla's Church when I was there. That if you wear it, the Virgin Mary appeared on Mount Carmel and told anyone that would be wearing my scapula, which is a little necklace around your neck, when they die, I personally will come down immediately after... Uh, the next Sabbath after you die and take you out of purgatory. If I would have died believing that. I wore a scapula. If I would have died believing that. You know where I'd be? And I would have died because I believed a deception. See, this is Satan's stock in trade. Look at 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4. Now, he says in verse 3, If our gospel's hid... It's hid to them that are lost. See, this is the deception of the new modern religion. There's no individual sin. You could be an adulterer. You could, you could uh, have three abortions. You could kill your own children. You could sleep with anyone you want. As long as you are on woke. As long as you think right. It's all good. Because there are no individual sins, only group sins. It's all grouped. 
And by the way, in that religion, there's no forgiveness. Only reparations. For how long? Forever. It just never ends. Why? It's just so profitable. <laughs> it will never end. Religion, by the way, is very profitable. And usable. You know how the, the biggest structure probably in the Christian world is St. Peter's Basilica where the Pope actually live, lives, has mass and everything. You know how that was financed? The sale of indulgences. Indulgences means you sell the right to sin. Pre-forgiveness. The people selling indulgences, that's why we had a reformation. They had a German salesman that was like so over the top. He had these ditties. As soon as the coin in the coffer sings, pop, out of purgatory and other souls springs. He even said things like, you could violate the Lord's mother. And if you have one of these certificates, you're good. That's how they finance St. Peter's. This is, you, you understand why there's going to be a judgment? You understand why there's a heaven or a hell? You understand why a holy God is angry at the world? Now, let, let, 2 Corinthians 4, if our gospel is hid, and it is, it's hid to them that are lost. Now, I hope that everyone in here it makes it a practice, whenever you can, to share the gospel. Someone says, well, I know, I'm not a very good speaker. Well, then run in, pay for your gas, and say, Jesus loves you, and run out as soon as you can. Do something! <laughs> Carry a tract. But when you do share the gospel, then you're going to find out this verse is true. Our gospel is actually hid from people. Now, what hides it? In whom the God of this world. This is another term for Satan. And that tells you something about this world. Who is the real prince of the world? Satan. The God of this world has blinded the minds of them that don't believe. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the very image of God, should shine on them. Now you know why so many Christian hymns are always salvation is seeing. At the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart rolled away. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. It's like creation all over again. Let there be light into your soul. By the way, this is the only way that we can be delivered from Satan's deception is by constantly being in a position where light comes into your soul. You open the door. You don't think you know it all or see it all. You stay open, right? You got to stay. Now, let me just do something here, okay? The, the, the Bible says, uh, uh, you know, the Bible is, uh, Satan is veiled all through the Bible. But it's a progressive re revelation. But by the time you get to the book of Revelation, it just comes out in the open. All of Satan and what he does and the war he makes on all of us. But one of the things it says is, the devil, he says, the serpent of old. Which he's talking about the garden. And then he says, that deceives the whole world. He deceives the whole world. That's his stock and trade, deception. But he does other things too, but deception. Now look, let me just do this. It's a biblical tour on the subject of deception for a minute. First of all, we are told that just by virtue of not being born again, People are deceived already by their own heart. Well, who knew that? Almost every, I've, I've seen a lot of Disney cartoons and I love like Robin Hood and all that stuff. I, I still laugh at all that stuff. But look, one of the messages that's just constant, follow your heart, believe in your heart. If everyone else tells you something's not right, but your heart tells you it's right, follow your heart. There's never been worse advice. 
Unregenerate men are already deceived by their heart. Now, how would you know that if you're already deceived? Well, you'd have to take someone outside of your life, take their advice for it. Like, how would I know that I had a spaghetti noodle in my beard if I don't have a mirror? Well, I'd have to take my wife's word for it. Then I'd have to trust her. Well, she'd never done me wrong before. She always only done me good, not evil. All right. God says, the heart of man is deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can know it? This is even without Satan. Satan hasn't even begun the deception yet. Heart's already deceived. And then you add to that the verse I just read. The God of this world is blinding the whole world with, with vain imaginations, high things, philosophies, reasonings. Emotional arguments, philosophy, rash, irrational or rational arguments. A man is this, the Bible, now let, let me just take you through this tour, okay? And I'll just give you the verses. You can look it up later. James 1, 22. A man is deceived already if he's a hearer and not a doer of the word. All right. Well, everyone, you know, we all know that. I mean, amen. That's right. So true. Don't just hear it. Do it. He's, in uh, 1 John 1, verse 8, a man is deceived if he says he has no sin. Well, I know a lot of people that don't believe that they have sin or, you know, they don't think sin's an issue. Uh, Galatians 6, a man is deceived already if he thinks he could sow and not reap. I mean, that's just self-deception. Satan it only comes in after we've done a complete work on ourselves of self-deception. And the capacity for self-deception is revealed from cover to cover in the Bible. Uh, for example, the classic verse. If you continue in my word, Jesus said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. What do the Pharisees say? We're Abraham. See, we've never been in bondage to anyone. As the Roman soldiers march outside the window, okay? After the Syrians, after the Babylonians, after the Persians. What? Never underestimate your own capacity to tell yourself what you want to hear. To have a bias toward what you want, not what's true. We've got to take this posture because there's a terrible test coming to the whole world. Okay, uh, he says... Uh, Galatians 6 again. If you think that you're something when you're nothing. Man, if you really think you're something. Boy, the worst things that ever happened in my life come after a time where, oh my goodness, I am really, I'm coming right up here. Okay, that's when, boom! <laughs> the best thing to do is to realize. And it's just true. We're nothing. Now, the Bible says, without me, you can do nothing. And that's true. Most people don't believe that, of course. But the good news about that is we're not without him. He said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. How about this? He's deceived, according to James again, James 1, when he seems to be religious. And religion is a good word, not a bad word. When he seems to be spiritual or devoted to God, and yet his unbridled tongue actually reveals his true condition. But he won't look at that. Just his religion. You're deceived if you think, this is 1 Corinthians 6. And a lot of people think this. In fact, most people probably think this. Most people that I've ever met think this. If they think that the unrighteous can inherit the kingdom of God, they are absolutely deceived. And if you think, you're, you're deceived if you think that sin itself in your life will not affect your relationship with God. That's a deception. I mean, look, all sin can be forgiven. I've never varied. I've said this for 40 years. All sins are, Jesus died for every sin. But don't think that sin doesn't affect you, your personality, and your relationship with God, because it does. Yeah. Let's be real. Let's be sober. We've got to get free of, now these, this isn't even Satan. 
You see? This is not even satanic deception. This is just living as a fallen person in a fallen world, and there's so much that's false. In fact, one of the things about the last days that is amazing and powerful, and it could be very unnerving for some, but it'll be very exhilarating for others, is that as we get closer and closer to the coming of Jesus, everything will be seen in its true light, clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. It's just like I've often said, all our institutions in America, which I've always been a proud American, I love our country and everything, but these institutions are increasingly revealing themselves to be anti-Christ. Even the so-called good ones. Law? That was an officer of the law that put his knee on someone's neck and wouldn't even listen to people as they went by begging for his life. <laughs> Same police department, by the way, two years earlier in the service of, oh, one of the highest ideals of the new religion, diversity. <laughs> We gotta have a Somali cop, you know that? We got a big Somali community, we gotta have a Somali cop. Somalia hadn't had a functioning government as a country in 18 years. It's just a series of rival warlords. So they take a cop and they make him a prime, this is the example of the Minneapolis Police Department. Wonderful, wonderful man. Muhammad, you're promoted. Muhammad, you're on our poster. Muhammad, you're out there, because it's diversity. Very early in his career, he and his partner are sitting in a car, a woman runs out to report a client crime, and without hesitation, he pulls a pistol and shoots her to death. Well, you didn't see any riots over that, did you? She's Australian. Doesn't she matter? She's been engaged, she's gonna get married. She killed them. The Minneapolis Police Department. Maybe it's not race, maybe it's political correctness that's killing people. Maybe it is or maybe it isn't race. I don't know the secrets of anyone's heart, neither do you. But they're play, they're, look, by exacerbating these fires, they're playing a very dangerous game. Now, let me get back to my subject, okay? First Timothy 4. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to take you to a few places today. First Timothy 4, because I have a lot to say, and I have a lot on my heart. First Timothy 4, 1. And look, the Bible, the Bible actually tells us that the whole world is coming into a test, the great ultimate test. And I think I quoted in my blog, the scripture that's so powerful, where Jesus said right before he's betrayed, Satan desires to have you that he may sift you like wheat. Well, God has Satan on a leash, but God will allow Satan to test us. He uses them. And it's according to your capacity, you know. He will always make a way of escape, the Bible says. But you've got to be aware. You, can, you can't just assume. See, there's really bad assumptions. I believe people are uh, uh, deceived if they think, well, because I'm a sincere person, then I can't be deceived. That in itself is a very dangerous deception. You've got to take God's word seriously. Jesus, in, in Matthew 24, you, you know this verse. The deception of false Christ, false prophets, if possible, even the very elect will be deceived. Now, I'm not living in paralysis about whether or not I'm, I'm deceived. I mean, I do believe that we have the light in the word of God and we must abide very closely to it. But I'm not going to go the other ditch and just rule it out. <laughs> When I wrote my book on the Toronto Blessing, we went up to this crazy church in Toronto where they're, I mean, they're literally rolling on the floor, beating their heads on the floor and the stage and thinking it's the Holy Ghost, okay? And we interviewed people because this became an international phenomenon. Hundreds of people were there. And almost all of them had asked the same question. They were Christians. They'd been Christians for years. They'd say things like, we don't even go by the word anymore because we have the spirit now. Well, that's deception, you know. And I said, don't you remember the Bible says that in the last days there'd be a deception, to deceive people? And they said, yeah, I believe that. I said, well, what if you're being deceived? And they laughed in my face almost universally. You know why? Because they'd been listening to false prophets that had told them, you are a special generation of Christians and you're going to be anointed and powerful and the saints of old are going to line up to shake your hands when you get there. They had been flattered and deceived to the point where they laughed at the very idea that they could be deceived. 
Let me tell you something. Anyone can be deceived. Otherwise, Jesus wouldn't warn about it, right? Anyone. If I ever change, if I ever depart from the word of God, I hope you get away and don't even look back. Don't hesitate. Seriously. And be Bereans. Don't take my word for it. Check the Bible out. Look, this is what we're told to expect. Now, 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now, <laughs> this is, this is uh, very heavy stuff. Uh, now, the Spirit speaks. This is the Holy Spirit. Expressly. Specifically. Not generally. Expressly. That in the latter times, some will depart from the faith. Well, <laughs> you've got a whole class of Christians that don't even believe that's possible. The, the, the one of the worst deceptions of all, the one saved, always saved. Why would Paul say that some will depart from the faith if they, can't, if they didn't have the faith? They are in the faith and they leave the faith. Well, what happens? Nobody can take you out of Christ's hands. Nobody! Jesus loves his own. He loves us to the end. But you can renounce it. You can walk away from it. Well, what happened? How'd they depart from the faith? Well, it didn't happen overnight. It had to do with what they listened to. And by the way, in the day of YouTube and the internet, this is very poignant. They actually gave heed to seducing spirits. Let me talk about this for a minute. What is, how does seduction work? Oh, you find someone vulnerable. You tell them what they want to hear usually about themselves. You work them really good. You tell it to them. See, look, there's nothing seducing about the real gospel. No one would come up with it as a seduction. Did you know you're a sinner and that everything you do is evil? And that you're liable to a judgment of a fiery lake of fire? And that you have offended an infinitely holy God? That there's nothing seducing about that. Someone's going to go away. Man, Pastor Bill made me feel so good about myself today. Wow, my self-esteem just went through the roof. Now, there are seducing churches. They will avoid that like the plague. Now, look, I tell as much good news as bad news, but i got to tell it straight. This isn't a seduction. You're not anything, and I'm not anything. We're nothing. <laughs> Like Corinthians says, don't, don't uh, let this pop your bubble, but there's not many wise and there's not many noble and there's not many good people among you. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's the Bible. That's Jesus. The true witness of God. Right? But for every true witness of God, never forget, there's 400 false witnesses who will seduce you and tell you Everything you've been longing to hear. And he says, and doctrines of devils. Doctrine, that's teachings. De devils have teachings? Oh, devils have some amazing teachings. I, I know people, they're, they're attracted to them. They just can't resist. The Eckhart Tolles and the... <laughs> There's so many weirdos out there that really are good communicators and they really do have spiritual teachings, but they're not based on the gospel. And let me say something, anything spiritual that is not centered on Christ is by definition demonic. Doctrines of devils. Speaking lies in hypocrisy. It's not the people that he's talking about speaking lies in hypocrisy. It's the demons. In other words, demons can be hypocrites. Well, yes, they can. Demons are hypocrites because they want to present themselves as something that they're not. This is the Holy Spirit talking to you. This is the angel talking to you. When really, if the covering was torn off that spirit, you would be horrified to the core of your being. They speak lies and hypocrisy, and their conscience, having their conscience seared, cauterized with the hot iron, and, you know, he gives a couple of things. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from certain meats. Oh, you should go vegan because animals suffer too. If you put, look, if you want to go vegan because you don't like meat, that's one thing. 
If you spiritualize it, you are actually listening to Satan. Did you know that? That's Hinduism too, by the way. Animals do suffer. Ever since the fall, suffering is necessary for life. So, you know, it's the devil that wants to come against eating meat. Not, not God. God ordained, now look, you shouldn't overeat anything, but I mean, God ordained sacrificial meals. Those are meals. But the devils, they're deceiving people. So many, in the last days, they come out like locusts, deceiving spirits. I mean, you really, really got to center yourself in the gospel and know what it is that you believe and your basis for forgiveness before God and don't let anyone rip that off from you. And you really have to guard against a false security. See, there's this reason why the story is told on Peter three times. Jesus said, Peter, the devil's going to try you. Peter said, not me. I'm sincere. And I believe he was sincere. Sincerity is no guard against deception. The only way to be free of deception is light. Remember what Jesus said. You will know the truth and the truth will make you free. Truth of every single kind will make you free in some area of your life. Where lies do the opposite, they bind you. There are so many people bound. Those people out in the streets, they actually think they're doing right. They're so bound by lies. I thought of the verse the other day. It says in Peter and Jude, they're like brute beasts, waiting to be killed, and captured, subdued, breaking windows, destroying. How's that going to help our brother, George Floyd, who went to heaven? By the way, did you know he's a Christian? He was in a ministry down in he had messed his life up before. He had a crime thing. But he found Christ in Houston and worked with street people, the worst of the worst of the worst. And then he moved up to Minneapolis to do that work. And he had the misfortune of running into a psychopath on a psychopathic police department. Same one that fast-tracked that Somali Muslim. <laughs> They're nuts. Now, I'm sure there are many, 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 many decent policemen there. I'm not castigating the whole thing, but you get a culture of corruption like that. And he, th this guy, they had four guys around guarding him while he murdered a guy right on the street. But burning down Target, <laughs> that's a disgrace, an insult. George is in heaven. I personally can't wait to meet him. But it's become a huge, huge uh, test. And the ignorance is what the devil takes advantage of. The Bible says we're not to be ignorant of his devices. And I'll just close. We got more to say on this subject, but I kept you long enough. The devil's great purpose and what he really fights for is to keep the world in ignorance of him and his actions and his true nature. It's to estrange men from God. If you think going out and punching a person that you think is a Nazi is a good thing, whether they are or not, you're lost. You're damned. You're on your way to hell. Where'd they get these ideas? Just pumped in the propaganda, the devil's in propaganda. They don't know that Satan is the one playing them. Even the leaders of the world, they think they're executing their plan and agenda. And I don't know what's going to happen, except I'm not going to be deceived about that either. There is not going to be a remarkable, complete recovery of American life. That's not what the Bible tells you to ex expect. Evil men shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. The whole world lies in the power of the wicked one. If there is anything at all with, represented by Trump, uh, which who, God can use anyone he wants, really, but it's a brief reprieve. Don't put any hope in it. 
That's a deception. Our hope is in the second coming of Jesus. That will be the appearance of mercy for this world. Jesus is coming back soon. So we must keep our eyes on him and we must keep in love and communion with each other. Father, in the name of Jesus, please use whatever is of this that's of you. Breathe your breath of life on it and help people. Help them to make sense of things. Help them to be delivered from the deception that many have fallen into. Let the truth make men free. Give us testimonies of people that were inflamed and enraged, but then Jesus, you came through and you unlocked the door and you filled their cell with your light. Oh God, like the Apostle Paul, there are many like him, oh Lord God. There are many Saul's out there, violent, muttering curses, doing evil to people and thinking they're doing good. I pray that you'd intervene. I pray you'd give us a harvest. I pray you'd give us people to baptize in this church too. We need a baptism in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless you all.